It's Kutztown Live with George Flatland, your campus community issues talk show. Call in live to Kutztown Live at 610-683-4859. That's 610-683-4859. Kutztown Live with George Flatland. And now, live from the KUR studios, it's Kutztown Live. Gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another edition of Kutztown Live. I'm your host, George Flaidlin, and we're going to be having a great show today. And it's filled, going to be jam-packed. No interviews today, I'm not sure at the, at the exact time right now. But today we're going to have a special guest my my mentor for this uh, semester for this wonderful organization of KUR, Kutztown University Radio, Nick Lawrence from WEU. So, Nick, welcome on to the show. Thank you, George. Thanks for having me here. It's good to be back again, and I look forward to spending this time with you today. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Again, Nick, it's uh, it's always a pleasure when you come on. So we're going to get right into it um, with C- with uh, with the death penalty when it comes to uh, the Boston uh, Marathon bomber, um, Sir uh, Sarnayev. Right. Um, Joe Carr Sarnayev. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's I, fine. Trying to pronounce his name is a little... A little hard for me. Yeah, well, it's hard because you don't. I mean, some people call him Joe Har, some call him Joe Carr. It's really, you know, it's. I think everything works really. Oh yeah, and so the que- the question remains for for him going through this process of you know he he was a, the part of um, ter- terrorizing uh, terrorizing acts uh, for the Boston bombing uh, last year, I believe, for the Boston Marathon. Now, when when uh, they're going through this trial process right now, they're trying to come up with the idea of whether or not he should uh, live out his life in uh, behind bars or whether or not he should uh, get the death penalty. Mm-hmm. And it's a difficult situation. I mean, as a jury, as someone on the jury, you have to, you know, y- you have to realize that your decision can't really be made up again. If you decide to have him have the death penalty, that is in your mind forever that you've essentially killed somebody. Yeah, I mean, it's a big decision. And I was thinking as, um, uh, you know, we're preparing for the show today that I read something that if he gets life in prison, George, he's going to be in a cell that is uh, 10 by 7. So that's uh, 70 square feet. He's going to be in solitary 23 hours a day out of the 24 hours a day. And when he has that hour off, he's not going to be in contact with anyone. So the the kid's like 21 years old, right? I think he was 19 when he did the bombing, or he was, it's two years ago now. Mm-hmm. So think about what that means. He's in a cell that's uh, 10 by 7, can't contact anybody, can't talk to anyone, can't communicate with anyone. I guess they'll just put his uh, food in there. And 23 hours a day. And the only, he has a window, apparently he would have a window in the cell, but the only thing he could see would be the sky. So... Which is the greater punishment? I mean, I don't know. People have this. It, it is a big debate because they're in the penalty phase of this right now, deciding whether or not he's going to get life in prison, and that would be his life, or he's going to get the death penalty. Yeah. I mean, if it, if it was for religious purposes, I mean, extreme religious purposes, mind you, then he, he's essentially done his job and he's done his deed. So he wants to be killed, essentially, mm-hmm. I, I'd have to think. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's what a lot of people say. One of the sides of the argument is that if you kill him, then you're giving him what he wants, which is a martyr's status rather than, mm-hmm. uh, you know, actually a real punishment. But then the other side basically is, well, you know, what's the ultimate punishment? The loss of life? I don't know. I mean, we have a different idea, right? A Western thinking is a little different than that. We value life and we want to perpetuate it for as long as we can. But you can also see where he's coming from, too, right? He, if, he, if he's going to get martyred as a result of it, what is the best thing? What, yeah. what, what do you take? What's your take? I mean, I mean personally, I am one who is against the death penalty. Um, I, I just think it's a worse penalty um, if you sentence them to life. I think it, you, you mentally and physically will you know, deteriorate these people instead of just giving them the quick out, yeah. out mm-hmm. here, then they're done. Um, I, 
I personally, that, that that's what I think. You're opposed to the death penalty. I, I am opposed to the death penalty. Yeah, and, and I am too. At the same, I, we're just talking about it because you can see how people can can go both ways on this. They can see both sides of it. Because I think that you know the ultimate penalty is the loss of your life. You get one of these lives, and that's it. But at the same time, if losing your life is part of your religion, if you're losing your life for a cause, let's say in his case, in the boat where they found him, he had scrawled on the uh, he had scratched into the woodwork in there. When you stop killing us, we'll stop killing you. Meaning, like he was he apparently his, his idea, along with his brother Tamerlan, was that they were. You know they were uh, doing this as a retribution for the bombing that was taking place in the Middle East that we that we've been doing, and so in his mind he was doing a, a good deed, an act of killing people who were killing his people. But then George, the kid was raised pretty much in the United States. He's not that much older than you are. Yeah. Right. He, for all intents and purposes, was very Americanized. Played rock music, enjoyed the American clothes, American food, and all this stuff. So, so what do you think? What what could have turned him? He said it was his brother that influenced him, and I think that's the uh, argument that yeah. the defense is trying to say, that uh, Joe Carr didn't have any a, a true mind of his own, that his older brother influenced him that much. What do you think about that? I, I mean, you can be influenced to do anything, but it, it's your decision, ultimately, whether or not you want to go forth with something. Yeah, I mean, that's what I think, too, but, I mean, is there that, or, I forget, are you the oldest in your family? I, I am the oldest. Okay, so do you think you could influence your siblings to the point that they would do something just because you said they should do it? Pro- probably not. Um, probably not. They're very intellectually smart mm-hmm. about what they, what, they, what they want out of life, I, I think. How, um, much, how much older are you than they are? I, I'm two years older than my brother and my stepbrother. Okay. And then I have a stepsister who's in middle school. Mm-hmm. I, I did a show about this with some of the kids in my uh, in, in the group that I have on the radio. And a couple of them admitted they thought that they could be that influenced by their older sibling. That did they, they really? Not necessarily to, you know, to take somebody's life, but mm-hmm. they felt that they many times looked up to their older siblings to the point where if their siblings asked them to do something, they might do it, even though it went against, um, you know, their personal belief. Actually, when you think about it, like, my brother and I do similar things mm-hmm. when I think about it. So whatever I liked, he was sort of kind of into it, too. So, like, one example is soccer, you know. You both we, think of the soccer? Yeah, we're, we're both into it. We both, you know, have our teams or whatever. We both, you know, like, love the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, I couldn't really influence my stepbrother because, you know, he came later in my life. But... I guess on that sort of term, I guess we I have some sort of influence. I I guess thinking back, um, like way back, uh, in church and stuff, um, we would uh, we'd be in the uh, what was it? It was called Melody Makers. We we'd okay. sing in the uh, children's like a, chorus. Okay. And my brother would quit if I quit, so I quit for a year, and then he quit, and then I joined back, and then he joined with me. Yeah, I mean, see, so, so I, I I guess if. If you let's suppose you were really, really passionate about some cause and it, and you did all the research and you found out why injustice was being done and you wanted to share that with your brother, maybe not you personally in this situation, but uh, let's say an older sibling doing that with a younger child. I mean, I can see it actually happening. I can see people really being influenced by their their older siblings, but I don't know to the degree. Like you said, it's ultimately it's a person's choice to choose to act in a particular way. I mean, they killed those people. Now they're saying in the uh, penalty phase that the uh, prosecuting attorneys are saying that he knew and plotted that he would be killing children in that, too. And yeah. they're making that part of the crime even more heinous than if he were just, you know, trying to kill adults. So, And they got him as, as an adult instead of, like, as a child. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah. makes it, yeah. I guess, 100 times worse. So when you think about 21, though, or 19, I mean, I, I, get, I always say this. When it's your kid... An 18-year-older is a kid. When it's somebody else's kid, an 18-year-older is a man, right? We call yeah. we, we say you're mature, you know, you, you're an adult at 18. But when it's your own kid, an 18-year-older doesn't seem like an adult. But somebody else's kid, yeah, yeah they're adults. Of course, they should know better. But I mean, I I will always be a little kid in the in the eyes of my mom. I mean, I'm just always the, the annoying little kid. <laughs> and she'll and she'll always see you that way, right? No matter what, she'll always see you as her son and and a, yeah. and a young kid. And that, I mean, that's just part of the aging process, I guess. We never see uh, people younger than us uh, or older than us in exactly the same light that we see ourselves at times. But I don't know. I mean, it, you know, I don't know. To me, death is the ultimate thing. And uh, so for him, now will he be a martyr in his own mind? I don't know. Maybe he will be. But will it matter? 
I mean, that people believe that there's an afterlife. Other people say there's no afterlife. So if he just dies and there's no afterlife, then the only martyr he's going to be is for anybody that thought he did a did the right thing by killing all those people, right? Yeah, it's it's tough. It's a, it's a difficult uh, thing. But the jury, I think what you said is interesting, though, because if you're on that jury, you have to be the yeah. one to make that decision. Yeah, and 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 giving that that sort of I guess omniscient point of view mm-hmm. of. It, does he live or does he not? It, you can you can say all you want to. Oh yeah, kill him, kill him. Like like he deserves to die. Whatever. Blah blah blah. He he terrorized all these people. He's he's terrorized our country. He's terrorized you know Boston that sort of thing. And then unless you're put into the jury position and then you have to live with that decision the rest of your life, I don't know how many how how often you will then think about man. I really just. At I really technically killed a human. I, I killed a human. Yeah. I mean I, I mean, I think that's a big deal. But, you know, some people argue that if he's in jail the rest of his life, there's a chance that on at least in his mind, he could have remorse. He could turn his life around. He could realize, you know what, I, I it was wrong for me to do that. But if you kill him, there's no possibility. Now, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, if he's going to stay in jail the rest of his life and doesn't, you know, with no possibility of parole. But from a personal perspective of his maybe he would have some transformation some remorse some uh you know feeling bad of what he did i don't know it's it's a difficult question i think if the jury had to pull the switch then uh if we all had to pull the switch <laughs> it would be a lot different than us just making the decision about somebody's life yeah. right if you were the executioner i i could not be the executioner i can <laughs> i mean sure i play like violent video games but it's just as as my brother used to say he used to be a vegetarian it's pixels not pigs you know yeah, that's true right <laughs> You're killing fake things not yeah. real things you know the difference between what's what's fake and what's real but if you had to pull the switch on somebody that was real i mean i i don't know how i could do that but you can see the hate that people have for those people who lost their loved ones or those who were wa- maimed you can understand right away how much they hate that guy right and they would want his death oh of course well i just <sighs> i know I think it. I think it hits at, at our the humanity that we have, because on the one hand, justice might say he took a life or took some lives. We're going to take his life. On the other hand, we have a moral uh, code that says we, you thou shalt not kill. Right. So how do you how do you justify one or the other when the human side of you said, yeah, of course he hurt us. We're going to hurt him. But the the spiritual side is supposed to say, you know what? We're not going to we're not going to act like that. That's the way animals would act. We are animals, though, believe it or not. I mean, without it, it, thoughts, they're not coming to my mind right now. But it's it's very difficult to try to, I just can't fathom trying to kill somebody, I guess, is what why I can't get over. Would you be okay, you would be okay with it, though, in self-defense? If somebody tried to attack, if somebody were attacking you or somebody was attacking your brother or your mom or whatever, could you see yourself killing somebody as a, as a way of, uh, you know, protecting them or yourself from getting killed? I mean, I don't think I would go to the point of killing someone, though. I think I would, you know, try to hurt them as much as possible. Okay. I wouldn't go to, you know, mm-hmm. go for the throat, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I, it's a. Gr- I mean, I think this is a great topic. It's difficult yeah. because there's, there's. I don't know that there's a real answer. There are only answers that pe- their opinions, mm-hmm. right? Your opinion, my opinion, everybody's listening opinion. But I don't know how you really answer this. Answer it with life. Yeah, I mean, if we didn't, if we didn't believe in life as a society, it would be easy, right? We don't care about life. You just take his life, and who cares? But that's not the way we've been raised or been taught. At least I haven't been. I don't think you have either. You've been taught to respect life, right? Yes, been taught to respect all people around me, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, from a young age, that sort of thing mm-hmm. has been taught. From my mom, it's. Yeah. We are. I I really think that we're products of our history. We're we're like a history book. We're a product of what we ra- were raised with. I mean, there's a genetic history, and so I think we come into the world with certain traits and and tendencies and things like that. But really, if we raised you in a different household. Would you be the same person you are today? Probably be a different person with a different set of ideals, Mm -hmm. um, different background and situations that would have happened in my life or Mm -hmm. not happened in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I come from a very odd background, I guess you'd say. In what way? Um, I mean, not not many people have, you know, 
I, I guess a lot of people have divorced parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, not too many people have uh, parents who went to prison. Uh, so that's, I guess, a unique thing about me. Yeah, I would say so. Um, so that there's that sort of aspect uh, to my life, mm-hmm. I guess. I was talking to a client of mine the other day, and I was surprised to hear that she told me that her mom was gay. And yet, um, obviously, she was a product of her mom, right? And her dad basically had taken off when she was a little girl and ended up having... She has 13 siblings, George, but her dad, who took off, never married anybody. And yet he fathered 13 kids. And so she and her mom have become the really the best friends that they can be, and she's straight. So you hear, these are all these arguments that we use. You know, if you're going to raise somebody this way, well, they're going to turn out that way. If you're raised by a gay parent, you're going to be gay. Well, right there, there's a case where it's not the, not the not mm-hmm. so. You know, I mean, there's like you said, you have a, you have a background probably different than a lot of people. Do you think that's affected you in any way? Um, yeah, I, th- I feel like it's affected me in the in the the way of um, trying to treat people better mm-hmm. um, than you know how it's been treated. Um, I'm just trying to think. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's difficult. It's a difficult topic because you can see you can take this any direction. This particular topic goes a long way when you're talking about life and death and who has control over it. Does the state have the right to take somebody's life? Because they, you know, they took someone's life. Does the state have the right to take life? I don't know that the Bible says thou shalt not kill except you're, unless you're a government, except if you're in war, except if you're self-defense. Yeah. I don't know that. I mean, all, we've made those rules that way. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've made, I mean, essentially all of our rules are moral. Yeah. There's no set rules. I mean, unless you, technically they're all man-made when you think about it. Yeah, they're not, they're not like black and white, even though we've made them to act as if they are, right, in a way. But they're not really. It's, in a, it's, it's like it's a society, society issues and norms, mm-hmm. yes. We yeah. set up a list of things to follow by, and mm-hmm. we follow by them, hopefully. Well, it's going to be interesting to see. I don't know. Uh, as I said, they're still in the penalty phase right now. Uh, so now we'll have to see what they come up with. As I think a big thing, as you said, though, if you were on the jury, what we... To be on the jury, though, you have to be willing to say that you can you can administer the death penalty. That's when they did the screening for all those people that were on the jury. They had to be able to say, yeah, if I, it comes down to it, I can say that this guy deserves a death penalty. But it's, you can say that, but how many of them have then thought, oh, crap, like, yeah, I, it's actually dawned on me that I'm actually going to, you know, be... Make that decision, yeah. Yeah, make one of the biggest decisions in my entire life. I, I don't know. I mean, that's this is the, the whole dilemma of this thing. So oh, you, you personally could not have been on that jury. Oh, oh, no. Oh, God, no. Yeah. And I don't think I could either. <laughs> Yet I can understand why people uh, feel that it's it's a justice issue to take a life if someone took a life. Yet at the same time, most of us were raised with the idea that, you know, the eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, it was the Old Testament stuff. We don't think like that anymore. We're supposed to think, you know, okay, if somebody hurts you, you're not supposed to hurt them exactly the same way. And if somebody takes somebody takes a life, you're not supposed to take their life. And yet we do that every day. Exactly. Which is why we're going to segue into our next issue. Okay for police and cameras and brutality and with you know when you have um the minor the minority group in in america and they they've been shot and killed unjustly by the police should you hang i guess come back after the police then well they have the authority right i mean they're the ones that are carrying the guns and they have we've given police the authority to do that but yeah i think that's a really really good question george should I mean that the one guy though the one that was in South Carolina where he shot the guy that was running away, they have him booked and he's going to go to trial and uh, so you're not allowed even as a policeman you're not allowed to murder someone if it can oh, yeah. be proven that you did right but we give we give men we give women this power to we put guns in their hands right and uh, I don't know I mean you think there's more of it today you think there's more today or is it just because we have better you know, technology. I mean, I'm sure there's always been police brutality. There has to be. Otherwise, these people wouldn't be saying, oh, yeah, it's it's been like this for right. da, 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 so many decades or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's the, the majority of, of minority people in an area. And then you have, you know, mostly Caucasian males um, who are running a specific, you know, 
police station or police office, wh- whatever the case may be, and they're getting away with this by, you know, they're the authority. They they can sort of cover their tracks, whatever. But it's going to be changing, I think, as now as most of these communities are, are getting uh, body cameras for their policemen and uh, dash cameras and things like that. It's not going to be quite as easy to be able to do something like that, right? Because now there are eyes watching. I mean, I guess it's still can, well, the, what was it, Eric Garner in uh, Staten Island? That was being recorded, and yet they still exonerated the police for having killed that guy. So maybe it's not as cut and dry as we think it's going to be because we have cameras that's going to make it, you know, make it better. I don't know. It's also, I think it comes back to what you said. It's more, it's subject to interpretation. <laughs> it's our human. It's our humanity, right? That's where it's not hard and fast. Morals are not necessarily black and white. They're what society accepts. And it's funny you say up to interpretation, but it's whose interpretation right. is the deciding factor of, oh, he was doing this for his self-defense, mm-hmm. even though you clearly see that the man has ran away and the police officer just continues to shoot him. Yeah. I mean that was no that reason. was horrific when we saw those things like that, and it's just oh the South Carolina video. Yeah, that was uh, uh, that was terrible because I mean, it, and now that we even see it, probably if this were thirty years ago, they wouldn't show that. You know what I mean? Today we almost see everything, and I've understood, I've heard that that in the United States, our news is even more. Uh, how can I say? It's kind of like whitewash, like the like horrific crimes and things that you, that happen in Europe. They actually show the the more blood and guts we do in the United States. We have we have wow. some sensitivity to it here. <laughs> You know, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a difficult thing. Excuse me for a second. Oh, you're fine. I mean, when you think about trying to trust your trying to trust your police station and you have all these things with, you know, Ferguson, for example, and trying to go back and forth with trying to find some sort of justice and not, you know, cover people's backs, it's, mm-hmm. it's very odd. We shouldn't be afraid of the police, right? I mean, I... I on some, I was thinking about that because I heard that the other day. Should we fear the police? What What is the difference between respect and fear? I mean, we need police because you could get yourself in a circumstance where somebody's attacking you, and the first person you want to call is a policeman to to help you, right? So we shouldn't fear them, but at the same time, I don't know anybody who doesn't slow down when they see a cop car someplace. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it's just the mentality that we've had as, as a society, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you see a cop, like, you know... Put your hands together. Exactly. Put your nice face on, you know. Exactly right. Hi, yeah. officer. How you doing today? You know, <laughs> trying to trying to do things like that. It's a, it's like cat and mouse game. It's unbelievable, really. We, we have to fear them, but at the same time, we respect them. We need them, but we fear them. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and then when they abuse their power, which, you know, some of these videos seem to have said, seem to have shown, it becomes a problem because then you don't know what to do. I know. I, I mean, I change my behavior if I see policemen. Oh yeah, right. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I, I've never gotten a ticket. All right, so, so I'm just gonna preface this story with that. Okay. Um, I was, I was driving in the wrong way, uh, by what is it? Right outside of, right outside the football field. You know, I went on the wrong side. It was like eleven o'clock at night. Here on campus, back. you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was, you know, going a little faster than you know what I probably should have been, and there was a cop car there. And then I, you know, went to the stop sign. Whoop, whoop. You know, the lights went up. I was like, "Oh crap! I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get my first ticket." So you know, you got, you got to act nice to the officer, of course, because yeah. respectful. You know of course, yeah, respectful. And um, you know, I was sort of questioning the whole time, like, what if I was a minority student? Would it have been? Would they would, have treated you differently? Yeah, would they? Would they have ticketed me? Because all know. I was given was a warning. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they got my license, got my registration, da da da. Went back to the car, came back. All right, this is, this is going to be a warning, but next time, you know, you're probably going to get something. Like, okay, officer, thank you. Like, what do you think? Do you think it would have changed if had I been a minority person? Yeah, it's, geez, without knowing that particular officer, George, and her perspective on this stuff, I don't know. But I, mean, I guess, I guess, statistically, people would say, yeah, I might have treated you differently. Are we. I think it's as terrible as we're making a general statement here, but but black people are treated differently than white people are in our society by white people, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm not individually. I don't think that's true. I think that people, you know, a white person can respect a black person and vice versa. But in general, I think most people would agree that black people are not treated exactly the same as white people are. Because I was, you know, I was in my car with a couple of my friends, um, but but what what would have been the situation had the you know. 
situation been different, you know, if, you know, um, we weren't, we weren't doing anything crazy. We were just, you yeah. know, sitting in the car, um, like any other kid, but put us in a different, you know, skin color. Mm-hmm. Who knows what happens? What if you would, and when he pro- approached the car, did he, I mean, were you re- like really respectful and kind of submissive in a way and apologetic? Oh yeah. I mean, I, it, it was a woman actually, a uh, woman <coughs> officer, okay. female. Um, but, but yeah, I was, I was very like, I, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't realize like where I was going. Um, excuse me. And, you know, she was, she was like, okay, she, she, she you know, she has to be stern with me. Well, yeah, obviously. of course. Yeah. Suppose you had given her attitude. Uh, yeah, exactly. It might have been different then too, right? I mean, yeah. not only not being uh, white or or black, but what if you'd given her attitude? Because, I mean, a couple people when I had discussed this on a radio show not too long ago, people would call in and they would just say, "Well, when the policeman said you're supposed to get down on the ground, get down on the ground." When the policeman says stop, you're supposed to stop. So, they were, the callers were justifying the policeman's behavior in shooting some shooting that guy in the back in South Carolina. Yeah, because he didn't respond to commands that the policeman gave. Uh, I mean, obviously, I don't know the entire context. No, but, and I don't either. So, like shooting them for not getting on the ground seems pretty pretty ridiculous. But I don't know. you see what I mean, though. So, yeah. in other words, the way we respond to the police is probably equally as important as the way they respond to us. Yeah. Now, but I think when you add in the, the skin, skin color issue, though, we're not going to know that unless we were black, right? I guess not. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel, you know, fortunate in some way that, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I'm Caucasian male, mm-hmm. um, you know. I um, listen. I listen to a lot of commentary about those, you know, when Ferguson first happened. And most of the uh, people, like, uh, I'm trying to think of his name right now. He writes for the the um, Washington Post. He's a Gene Robinson. He's a black fellow that writes for the Washington Post. And when they were talking about it, and another guy, uh, Jonathan Capehart, these were on MSNBC, but they were, they're, you know, they were consultants, I guess, for from the newspapers. They were saying that white people don't understand that you have to teach your kids to be submissive when you're black. You have to make sure that uh, you don't give uh, any, uh, you don't sass back at all to a policeman. You always have to make sure that the your your kids take a position of the of inferiority when you're with uh, a policeman. And they say that you know white people don't understand. We don't raise our kids to say that. But he said the both of these guys said, and they're you know they're professionals and they're well educated. They said that most black people raise their kids. To be in fear of police and to be submissive to police because they know that there's going to be an issue if you don't do that. You weren't taught that, right? No. I, was, I wasn't taught that. You know, taught to, you know, respect the cops. They're your friends. You right. know, they're exactly. out to help you and things like that. And yeah, yeah, I mean, in grade school, I mean, they show kids pictures of cops and, and firemen and we're, they're taught that they're, we're taught that they're our friends. But I don't know that that's the real, I don't know that, that people in the black community teach their kids exactly the same way that perhaps you and I were, were raised. I mean, it's, race is still an issue. I mean, it's how long since the Civil, civil, uh, since the civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, the 1860s, right? And we're still dealing with racial issues. It seems crazy to me. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, you're, you're younger than I am, so your generation I don't think is as prejudiced as uh, older generations are, but I well, may be wrong. You might be a little bit surprised in that aspect. I know really? a few students who have, you know, prejudiced ideas, you know, they're they're different. That's what they say. They're they're different from us. Really? They actually talk like that in a, openly. I mean not not openly. No, but it, but in among your friends though, people will I mean, talk like that. I mean they're not my they're not my friends, they just happen to be people I know of. Yeah. Um but it's and I laugh. It's like you're serious right now. Yeah, man. I'm ser- I'm serious. I'm dead serious. Are, are you, you like you're actually hard. Yeah, yeah. I really am. And that's what they that's what they tell me. Mm-hmm. And and I just shake my head, like like this is this is 2015. Right. That's what I say. It's 2015. We still see colors. Oh yeah. Like like my this, this is what they say. They're like, oh yeah. The, my whole family. No, no, no. They just don't like you know other races and stuff. Like, are you serious? Yeah. Like sure. I've I've heard that from like. Maybe some of my family members who are from North Carolina who are sort of raised that way, but I figured, you know, up here, Pennsylvania, you know, you know, you cross the Mason-Dixon line, you right, know, exactly, things like that. But, 
But yeah, I hear they're different from us. Well, we're all different from each well, other. I was going to say, I mean, and, and different groups have been discriminated Gosh. against over time. And people will point that they say, well, the Italians were discriminated against, the, the Irish were discriminated against. Yeah, but not in the same way. In other words, they, they, you can't change your skin color. People have changed their names that have come here, you know, early on. They were Italians and they changed their names, made them sound more Americanized and things like that. But somebody's skin color is much more obvious. And so. If we're going to judge people, I mean, as terrible as it is, I might say I understand somebody from the South, like you were saying, still thinking like that because, uh, you know, racism and inbreeding that stuff dies hard. But you wouldn't think that's still here. And yet it is. Yeah. And then and then what's what's ironic about the whole thing is that they'll, you know, you have your urban culture, which, you know, like, for example, clothing and shoes mm-hmm. and and um, music, for say. Like, they'll listen to, you know, majority um, African-American music, you know, very, uh, some vulgar rap music. They'll, they'll rap it out. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll dress in Jordans, I guess. Um, and, and they're still, they still have that racist mindset of, like, I don't, I don't understand you people. I, I don't understand them. I, I really don't. Mm-hmm. And, but and the, it's it, so you think that you're thinking that maybe I'm a little naive when it comes to about your generation. I mean, I always think that because I can only judge by the callers that call a radio station that it seems like the older ones are the ones that seem to have a stronger sense of prejudice. Where the teens that I work with, they uh, they seem to be much more accepting. And I ask them, "Do you see the color of the other person?" And they tell me, "No." Now maybe just that specific group of teens I'm working with, they don't see color because they, you know, you guys are products of uh, desegregation. When I was a kid, that, their people were still segregated. You know what I mean? So, but after that all changed, you guys have grown up going to school with with uh, kids of other races. You ride on the bus with different other races and things like that. Well, here's the thing: I remember back in high school. You'd still have different. You'd still have different. Sec- Maybe it's just my high school, mm-hmm. but you'd still have different sections of. Yep, here are the, here's the majority of the white people over here, and here's the corner of you know. They minorities. actually was that way even when you were in high school. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's. I'm. There's no. There's no set law. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure. There's like, um, you know, the more socially inclined, I guess, uh, branch out and um, like minorities will like. Like, um, I forget a few guys, but you know that like, like I'm fine with them. And then, um, you you just get like these sections. It's, it's very odd. It's interesting when you, when you're around somebody who is really, really biased or prejudiced and you're not that way, it's striking. I mean, you can, you feel that or you feel their hate. You feel you, and you have to wonder, as you said, how does somebody think like that? Where do they get to think like that? Uh, because it's so different from the way you see things, right? You don't hold any. I, I'm for one, I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but it doesn't sound like that you hold any anger to someone just because of their race. No, you don't hate President Obama because he's black or anything. No, because like I'm a that. Democrat. So. Okay, but if you you are in favor of him, you I mean, there are people that don't like him just because he's black. Now I'm not playing yeah. the race card with that. It's a fact. Yeah. Now, not everybody, obviously. Many people don't like his policies, and that makes more sense. If you don't like the president because you don't like his policies, that's fine. But that's nothing to do with his skin color, right? Yeah. I mean, you can hate all, hate every single policy, and then still be fine with with the person. With the person, yeah. Yeah, you would think. You would think. I mean, look look how much people hated President Bush when he was in power because of the. Uh, um, Iraq war. I mean, there were so many, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people protesting around the world about us going into Iraq, and he went anyway. No weapons of mass destruction, all of that stuff. So people hated him at the time, too, but it wasn't because of his skin color. They didn't like his decisions, right? Yeah. This you can feel sometimes. There are people that have a, a gut feeling that they don't like it because he's a he's a black guy. Or now Loretta Lynch was just, uh, she was confirmed today as the first female black uh, attorney general. And okay. Eric Holder was a, a black attorney general, first time in history for that, I think, anyway. And so people hate that because it's uh, it's like they think, well, these people are going to now, quote, take over. You know, it's crazy. Pre- <laughs> prejudice is, is uh, what does prejudice mean? It means prejudging, right? Basically, it means making a decision yeah. without knowing what you're, you know, all the facts, I guess, in a sense. I don't know. I mean, but here, but here's I, prejudice. The word is kind of odd to me because as humans in general, 
not regarding race or color or anything, ethnicity, take it all out. In the first, I learned this at a, at a, at a workshop. Uh, we went on a retreat for my connections group, actually. Okay. Went to Lake, Lake Trout. And it's sort of like a team building exercise thing. Uh, you stay the weekend, you learn some things about yourselves as a group, as a whole. And the exercise at first was um, we judge people in the first 15 minutes, mm. whether or not we like them. We have 15 minutes to make that first impression, which is scary to think about. Yeah, because then that's the one that usually lasts. It takes a while for people to change that once they've made that first impression, I guess, right? Yeah. And your mind is already made up within 15 minutes, which is scary to think about. It is scary. It's pretty strange to me. that, But yet, I, maybe that's what I guess we do. If you saw the data on it, I guess that's what we do. I mean, they say, well, you never get a second chance to make a good first impression, right? So if you mm-hmm. if you screw up the first time with somebody, it's tough to change that. I remember um, on the radio, many times people will label me as a liberal. And in an area that's mostly conservative, okay. Those so damn liberals. Uh, right, I mean, they, and they they attack me for being a liberal, and they use the word liberal as if it's a terrible word. So I, cr- I had this new, I had this brand new show that I was doing for a while in W E E U, and uh, it's coming back again now. It's called Nights with Nick, and what it was though, it was a talent show. Basically, we we featured a lot of uh, local talent. And I'd play, uh, you know, I'd spin some records and things like that. And people loved the show. So this one guy called me one night. He says, you know, Nick, I have a whole new respect for you now because you're not what I thought you were. I mean, you see, it's, it's amazing to me. That, and one person told me he, he didn't like me because he thought I was a communist. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, you, you just, people will, people, as you're talking about making an impression, George. People will make an impression of you based on what they think, not necessarily in who you are. Yeah. You could be one, a totally different person from what they think you are, but they're going to treat you the way they think you are, not the way you really are. Yeah, and, and trying to make everyone happy, that's... Problematic, right? Horrible. Yeah. I, I've tried to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And I've probably gone crazy because of it. Yeah, and we all do that to a degree, but you, you learn after a while that there are some people that no matter who, no matter what you do, no matter how you are they're never going to be pleased because it's not about you. The problem is actually in the other person, but they, they make it out as if there's something wrong with you, you know, and if you buy into that, then basically you're screwed because you try to please people. I mean, we, we all want to please. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you make that your goal in life, you're bound to lose. You're never going to be able to please everybody. I think everybody knows that, but we still do this stuff anyway. You know, you keep trying. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting stuff. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick quick break here but we'll be back after these messages <coughs> that was good. it's telescopic topics a look into the world above us do you ever wonder what started the so-called space race why the united states even bothered to put a flag on the moon during the apollo 11 mission the answer to that question goes all the way back to the fall of october 1957 when the ussr sent a small 23 inch satellite called sputnik into orbit around the earth so what's the big deal for the past couple decades, the United States has been moving away from space exploration as the public focuses on terrorism and the economy. However, back in 1957, having the Russians successfully send a satellite into orbit was a major issue. It was also a national embarrassment for the U.S., since Russian missile capabilities were proven superior. At this point in time, the Cold War was in full sway, both in nuclear arms race as well as battle of political influence. Russian communism and American democracy were at two opposite ends of a spectrum. When Sputnik launched, it surprised the West. Newspapers all over the U.S. feared Sputnik being a weapon of mass destruction. Other papers wondered if it were a device that allowed the Russians to spy on Americans. In reality, Sputnik was made to test the ability of sending up a satellite and have it send information regarding Earth's atmosphere. The first satellite ever to be launched by mankind stayed in orbit for three months and was able to transmit data back to Earth for roughly a month. On top of that, it made 1,444 rotations around the Earth. Regardless, the Russians had succeeded in launching a missile into space, which to both the Department of Defense and the American people worried that Russia had the potential of putting nuclear weapons into orbit that could potentially strike the states. The space race began with Sputnik. 
The United States, in response to the so-called Sputnik crisis, poured millions into education programs and also funded NASA, which, as we all know, has made tremendous strides in creating new and interesting technologies. It is only natural that 12 years later, with the dedication to popular support and political funding, the United States was able to send the first man to the moon, thus proving that once again, the United States had a clear lead. Telescopic Topics, a look into the world above us. Stay tuned to KUR for more telescopic topics. And for more information or to hear the segment again, click on the Telescopic Topics icon on the KUR website at www.kutztown.edu slash KUR. Telescopic Topics is a production of the KU Physical Sciences Department and is recorded by the KU Astronomy students in the studios of KUR. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. And we're back live here on Kutztown Live. I'm your host, George Flaylin, with, with uh, Kutztown Live on KUR, the Kutztown University Radio, the voice of Kutztown University. And Nick, I'm going to welcome you back on the show again. Thanks, George. It's always good to be here. I, I really enjoy spending this time here in KUR. It's a different medium than, than what I do on radio, but this is really cool here. And I mean, in WEU. I think this is great. You have a great forum here to talk about stuff. I appreciate it. And it's, uh, it's always great to have a mentor uh, talk to me uh, with ideas, bouncing around with uh, what, what's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, I feel like it's important uh, to be up to date on things when I'm not studying frantically for all my finals I mean, that's the thing. You guys have to focus on your work. This is not like your full-time thing where you can put your in total attention on this. But I think you're doing a great job, man. Oh, well, I appreciate you it. No, you are. So when, when it comes to trying to stay stay ready for finals, what, what, what did you do to try and do that? To study for finals? Yeah, yeah. How'd you, uh, how'd you uh, kick back, relax sometimes, but then, you know, Get down, study hard. Well, I would say the way I would do it today would be very different from the way I did it when I was in college. When okay. I was in college, I did like every other college student. You, you panicked, you stayed up, you, you know, you burned the midnight oil, they used to call it. You know, you'd be around all the time, and you, you thought by studying all night long, you'd do better. But ultimately, it never panned out that way because you were too tired the next day. <laughs> but yet people still, I guess they still do that, don't you? You guys pull all-nighters yet or not? I mean, who pulls all nighters anymore? Uh, I'm I mean, asking not you. not me. I'm not. You, I'm not guilty of that. No, no way. Okay. I mean, yes, I do that. So, so what? In the past, people would take those things they called no dose, which was basically a uh, a caffeine pill. That was the the drug of choice at the time to keep a person awake. Or they, you know, they drank a lot of coffee and stuff like that. Or maybe drank cokes because or, or Mountain Dew because they were loaded with caffeine. I'm not sure. What are kids doing today? They do the same things, or are they going someplace else? Cocaine, all cocaine. Oh, I'm, just, all I'm co- just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I brought this up last week on my, on my show, actually, with uh, with the use of Adderall. Okay. Uh, kids using Adderall. Stimulant, yeah. Yeah, to try and, you know, focus on uh, studying for uh, long periods of time in a very, you know, focused manner, I guess. Is how. George, is it because people aren't, aren't studying the whole semester and they try to cram it in at the end, or is there just so much material? And I'm asking because I just need to know now. Is there just so much material, and that's why kids do this at the end? I mean, is, are people not being serious about it the whole semester and then panic at the end? Or is it just there that much stuff that you have to know? Um, let's see. Not to knock our university. Um, I feel like the rigor for... For our courses, at least in my introduction classes, mm-hmm. you know, I can't speak for anything mm-hmm. above what I've taken. Um, I feel like it's not really necessary if you've been doing it the whole semester. Well, well, that's what I'm thinking, I but really, I, I, you know, it's been a long time for me to be in college. so I really do feel like that. Um, however, sometimes I feel like with, with projects, mm-hmm. those things are real time consumer. Um, and then when you, when you ask... When, when employers ask for you or the university says, oh, get involved, oh, do this, oh, have a great GPA, mm-hmm. oh, make sure you get your internship, the university is asking you a lot. And if you can do it, power to you. Mm-hmm. But if, if I guess that's where you should have decided whether or not you should have come to college, mm-hmm. right? I was going to ask you, how did, how did you transition? You're a freshman this year, right? You're ending your freshman year? Yep. 
Okay, so how did you transition from high school to freshman in college? Was it a major shift for you, or were you pretty much the same guy? If I met you in September last year, would you be the same guy, your study habits, the way you, you know, whether in the past you were a party or you're not a party? I mean, are you the same guy, would you um, say? I would not say I'm the same guy. Okay. I would say, here for 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 all my academic life, I've always remembered me being very, very studious the first half of my year. Okay. Um, you know, you're excited for school. You exactly. like want to do homework mm -hmm. like that, that sort of feeling like, Oh, it's something to do. I've been doing nothing this entire summer. Like, let's do something. And then you get to Christmas and then you get the second semester and it's like, okay, now we're doing work and mm -hmm. I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. Um, but, in high school, I, I took you know I took hard classes, I took honor level and AP level classes. Okay. I took them because my friends took them, mm -hmm. um, and you know I didn't really want to take the CV classes, the college prep classes, um, and in that sort of aspect, I wasn't exactly the smartest one. I wasn't the brightest bulb. You mm -hmm. know, I did enough. Mm -hmm. Got into college, yay me. Um, so was the transition, was it a big transition for you or was it a, it was a pretty much an easy slide to come into college? Um, it was an easy slide because I worked my butt off. Okay. So you did work hard then? I did work hard, um, because my parents gave me the option of if you have good enough grades, you can have your car second semester. So I was like, cool, let's study really hard. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so incentives are always nice. Um, however, I started to realize, you know, you if you want to make something out of your life, you're going to have to work hard for it, mm -hmm. um, which actually speaks to my fraternity, Kalei Patakala, um, not without labor. Um, anything worthwhile is difficult to achieve. That's true. Um, so I sort of live my life now by that. Was that high phrase. school relatively easy for you, even though you took those great, those hard courses, AP courses in college? Um, did you? Was it relatively easy for you? I would not say it was easy at all. Okay. Uh, I'd say it was difficult uh, because I was also heavily involved again um with my sports and clubs and things okay. um sort of loaded up uh which is may or may not be the reason why i could have a higher gpa now um here uh but i feel like all the experiences i've had i really wouldn't want to give them up mm -hmm. well i mean you know it's not i'm not failing by any stretch yeah, of the no, no, of course so. not but we're not we're not just one i mean you can be just be totally focused on academics and never broaden your horizons with anything or you can have a more rounded approach, a more well-rounded approach, which sounds like you're doing a more balanced approach to things, right? I remember when I came here, when I first came to Kutztown, man, I was panicking because I, would, I had done well in high school than the top couple of kids in my class, but I didn't study a whole lot because the stuff just came to me. When I came to college, it was a whole different world yeah. for me. It was much more rigorous then. The professors expected a whole lot. I don't know what it's like today in college, but the professors in my day, they expected a lot from you. And you had to put hours and hours each day into each class that you had. And, and I had never done that before. So it took me a long time to, uh, to adjust to the differences in the... Uh, from high school to college, and and when I was in high school, there were no AP courses, so there wasn't okay. anything. Pre there were you, you were there in college prep, or you were in general courses. Mm -hmm. So the college prep would have been, uh, I guess, equivalent to almost like an AP course today. At least they were the harder level courses. But um, yeah, I mean, it, to me, college was a big surprise as to how much work I actually did. But I also was a dedicated student. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the guys that I roomed with when they came here, they partied all the time. They were yeah. having fun all the time. They didn't take it seriously. They didn't show up for class. And, and you know, they try to get you into that lifestyle. And I wasn't going to do that because my parents worked hard to get me to come here to begin with, you know. So so you probably see the same thing, right? You see kids that are really dedicated and other kids who could care less. Yeah, and and you feel bad for them that they're not so dedicated in what, like, they're building upon their future. But it's, you know, it's their call. Mm -hmm. They chose to come to college. They choose to spend thousands of dollars to just not go to class and party all the time. You can do that. Do it. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to, you're not going to get the degree that you want. You're not going to get the job that you mm -hmm. have desired your mm -hmm. life. So this thing about Adderall, how prevalent is that from your experience or talking to people that you know? Is that something that, is that like the, the drug of choice or are people still drinking, you know, uh, caffeine load laden drinks and things like that rather than there was Adderall pretty, uh, you know, is, is it around a lot? I mean, people naturally drink caffeine anyway. Right. Um, there is obviously more Starbucks going around, so mm -hmm. people always are drinking that. But I, I'd say it's it's probably a problem. It, I, really? Like, you think 10%, 20% of kids use it or not? 
I, I'd say something or something like that. Really? I mean, I have no official ballpark. Well, right, yeah, of course. They're just talking but, about um, your experience. But yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely out there. You, you hear of it. Oh, you want some? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and people still do all nighters. They still pull all nighters. Oh, of mean, course, that's a common thing. That, that's never going to change. Really? Okay. It's what it's what happens when you uh, you forget about projects, you forget about work, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh. And you've got to do it. I mean, even the most studious of, of students um, have, have done it that I've come across. They, so, so good students are not necessarily, in other words, even good students have to pull all-nighters at times. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah, it's, it, I've seen those students as well. They, they still have to stress over things because they, you know, they've, I don't know, played video games or something. Mm-hmm. Like, how dare you play video games? No, it's, it's you know, just managing your time, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think... I mean, personally, I kind of work better at night. Maybe that's just me saying it that because be, yeah. mm-hmm. because I've you know always done it. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I kind of like working at night. So what happens though? Are, are, do kids do well then on those tests when they pull all nighters? I mean, is it worthwhile to do it, or is it just something to be able to say, you know, I pulled an all nighter? Do you actually benefit from doing that? You think? Have you done um, well as a result of doing that? I, ha- I have done well. I've, yeah. I've gotten okay. A's on tests. I've, I've aced things while I've pulled all-nighters, and then, you know, you get the occasional, like, bad grade mm-hmm. because of it. Um, so I can't really justify with, like, the whole statistics with saying if you pull an all-nighter, you're screwed. Like, okay. that, that's not the case. So kids are not necessarily, like, really tired then. And in other words, do you, once you've pulled an all-nighter, what do you do then after that? Do you sleep? Well, or- after you're... After your test, yeah. Oh, you nap all day. That's what you do then. You go back to your room and you and you sleep. Oh yeah. Okay. That's what I'm just checking. I'm seeing out without before. without naps. There's no <coughs> co- college kids are done for. Really? Oh yeah. Oh, it, it, naps are a beautiful thing. Okay. Well, I'm just it, like I said. I'm always interested in this stuff, and uh, I like to know what things are, how they're like today versus the way they were before. I don't remember taking naps. That's what I'm trying to think. I don't remember. Really? That. No, I don't remember oh. that. I, I don't. I played a lot of basketball. I like doing that. There weren't as many activities. There weren't okay. video games and things like that. You guys have other distractions. So, so video games. When kids play video games, why do you think that is? Is it just for the fun of it, or is that a de-stressor? It's a de-stressor. Um, I mean, people get into it too. You get like you get like um, all these people who like want to play each other on the floor with with uh, whatever games they're into. And um, you get some sort of camaraderie out of it. You know, who's the best at this game? Who's the best at that? Uh, but it's also another form of laziness, I'd say, because you just sit there and you and you play your, uh, your. Uh, I guess you didn't play video games back in the day. but No, they, no, gonna... they, were, they weren't around. My, my kids had video games, but not me, though. You okay. know, and I watched them play and all that stuff, but uh, it wasn't part of my generation to have all that stuff. Technology I'm, is amazing today. I honestly... I can say that I've played the least amount of video games since I've gotten to college. Really? Oh yeah. yeah. I've. I mean, I'm trying to do all these clubs and stuff, so it's it's hard for me to do that. Um, and sometimes I wish I could like just chill out sometimes, mm-hmm. um, which I was able to uh, the other day. Um, I guess that was Sunday. Yeah. See, this is what happens when when yeah, finals time, happen. All the days run together. Your, your right? days all run together. Yeah, it's get just, it. ah. yeah. But I was able to. You know, really take in Kutztown Sunday. Okay. It was a beautiful day, right? And, uh, you know, clear skies. Um, and I just sat underneath uh, one of the trees outside the library because the library wasn't open until 2 o'clock. Okay. Uh, so I just sat there, put my book bag behind my head, you know, just took it all in. It was in. great, right? You'll oh, it, it was wonderful. Yeah. I'll have to show you a picture then. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I'll put it probably on the Facebook page. But uh, it was just, you know, a picture with the... The tree and the blossoms. The, I'm not very good at describing things. I should though. Um, and you see the 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 green of uh, the sub lawn, and you see you know Schaefer Auditorium in the background. It was just, I just felt at peace. Hey, it's, I was going to say it's probably very peaceful. I don't know that your generation knows a lot of peace, because you guys relax by playing games, right? Rather than just sitting still and being quiet like you did, or in you know taking in nature and things like that. So. Uh, but I, I, you know, and something as simple as just you know, just breathing in the nose, breathing out through the mouth, right, exactly, yeah, is very refreshing to me at least. I mean, those are all the natural things. I don't know where we, why we've ever gotten away from them. But I think it's good that you did that. 
because you're finding there is there are other things to do other than play video games, right? I mean, yeah. video games are great, but they they I think a lot of times people do that stuff to de-stress. It does it looks like they're just wasting time, but I think on some level maybe kids are really that stressed and that takes your mind off of that stuff when you play a game like that. I don't even think yeah, it it can be used as stress, but I think it's just, you know, something to do. Really. Oh, I mean, I, I but think are you we're guys just... bored. I mean, are kids bored here on campus, you think or not? Yeah, which is the sad thing. How can you be bored with all the activities and stuff and all the studying you have to do? That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> you can't... That's why I love being in all the organizations I'm in, okay. because there's always something for me to do. Okay. Yes, we're in Kutztown. We're not in Philadelphia. If we went to Temple, there would be, you know, there's, you know, shopping, there's this and there's that. There's, right. But essentially, the college experience is, you know, finding yourself through different for me at least, is finding yourself through different organizations and different experiences, mm-hmm. which has been great. Well, and Kutztown, I mean, is not like a, it's not a metropolis. Like, I mean, there's only yeah, so many things you can do here in, in Kutztown, yeah. as you are saying. I know if, if you were in the city, if you are in a city school, you'd have a lot of distractions, right? But you don't have that many here. I mean, Kutztown's a great town, but it's not, it's not the place that's going to be the most exciting place in the world, I wouldn't think. And I'm not, not knocking it because there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a benefit. A lot of the small college towns are like that, though, right? I mean, colleges in the state system, a lot of them are in these towns like Millersville and, and uh, Elizabethtown. And, I mean, they're all, they're all in, in towns like Kutztown mostly, aren't they, or not? I would think. Yeah. I mean, I, I they're like not it. They're not like city campuses like Temple or like Drexel or any of those things in, the, in Philly, you know. So. And they're way more expensive. Uh, yeah, just a bit, <laughs> just a bit more. So, so this has been cool. Right. This what, is, what did you see in colleges when you went out? When I was looking for colleges yeah, yeah, initially, yeah. I didn't really do a whole lot of shopping because I knew for a lot of it was money in the beginning. And so I tried to pick a school that was, I wanted to be away from home, didn't want to commute, but I didn't want to be across the United States. A yeah. lot of the kids that I work with on Saturdays, they, they, for some reason, they want to go across the country. It's like they want to be away from their families until they go See, ahead. That's, that's, that, that's exactly what I wanted you know, sophomore year of high school. And then you get to junior and senior year, and you're like, man, it'd be kind of cool to come home sometimes. Absolutely. Just to, like, have mom do my laundry every sure, now and then. Yeah. Just <laughs> Real-world stuff, like, yeah. you know, and basic like, needs. Like, yeah, basic needs. Like, be able to come home and, you know, see people, you know, instead of seeing them just Christmas and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, summer break. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're not living at home, it doesn't matter whether you're a thousand miles away or a hundred miles away. I mean, you're it's it's you're just not there. You don't have anybody watching you, and you get to make decisions for yourself. So, it really wasn't a big choice for me. I liked Kutztown when I saw it, and it was a great place. And uh, you know, met a lot of really cool people when I came here. I didn't stay. I wasn't here the whole four years. I went off to another university after this. But but this was uh, this was my beginning for me, and I loved it. It was good. You know, I wasn't, I didn't come from an exciting background, like from the city. So this matched my background pretty well. So, and the people were cool. So I met some really great professors here in the day. Of course, they're not here now, but in the day they were here and they were good. Now was the, why is the DMZ called the DMZ? The DMZ? Yeah. I've heard different stories for why it's you called. You mean in Korea, that DMZ? No, 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 no. Our, our DMZ I don't here know. on campus. I don't know that one, man. I don't really, the, I've never heard that term here at Kutztown. The, de, the demilitarized zone? Yeah. I didn't know about that. You're, you're going to educate me with something. Really? Now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, appar- apparently the story goes, uh, I mean, you know, he said this or whatever. It's passed down to me. I, I may get this wrong, so I'm just going to preface that. But apparently the demilitarized zone is the place where men and women could still hang out like oh, okay at hours i'm not sure because the women were in different dorms than men and the women had different hours that they could get back to the dorms than men could i didn't i don't so know that wasn't a never heard of it no there was a there was a place called Shea new that was right at the at the base of rothermill hall okay and it was a it was like a i want what would you call it i don't like a cafe coffee house whatever everybody went there at in back in the day and that was the place so i don't know when that ever changed because it's been a number of years since i came back here now since i've been here to see you guys you know but uh it was the place that everybody hung out and it was open all the time and do you do you remember which um which halls were there when you when you went when you came here well like i said no, half the half the campus wasn't here then yeah. George. it was small it was a lot okay. small schaefer auditorium was here obviously old main was here Rotham Roll Hall was here. Uh, I'm trying to think. 
and there were some new science buildings that were just built right around the time that I was here, but I, I don't remember. It's been a long time, man. Wow. It's cha- the campus is huge now to me compared to what it was when I came here. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, and it's not even that big, but it's huge compared to the way it was in the, in the past. Yeah. You, you don't realize how fast time goes. It'll be the same thing with you someday, right? Yeah, you'll yeah. come back and you'll see it and say, wow, this is different from what I thought it was anymore. Wow, back in my day. Exactly. And that happens fast. You don't even have to be old for that to happen. <laughs> It happens, man. Crazy. Crazy how time flies. Because we're almost done with this show. Are we? Yeah, we pretty much are. That's impossible. We've had a great... Yeah, it was good. This was a good show. To end, for me, to, to end the season here with you, this was great. End the season fighting strong. Yeah. Any last words for your last Clip Sound Live broadcast with us, Nick? No, other than I, I, I love this place. I love the school. I like working with you. I uh, worked with Steve Majiri last time, last semester, and enjoyed that a whole lot as well and hope to come back again and uh, spend some more time here and get to know uh, kids at Kutztown as well as the campus again. George, thanks a lot for having me as a guest on your show. Well, thank you, Nick, for coming on to the show once again to talk with me about all kinds of topics here on the Radio Voice of Kutztown University. KUR, Kutztown, and we're going to throw it back on back on some more music but any views then, or opinions expressed on KUR are not necessarily those of Kutztown University Kutztown University Student Government Kutztown University Student Services Incorporated KUR staff and management or other affiliated organizations